So I'd like to welcome everybody to our very first screencast on chapter 19. And chapter 19 is going to be our very first opportunity to make our way into a very large phylum. And that phylum is the phylum Arthropoda. And the phylum Arthropoda is going to contain a huge number of animals. It could be anything from a crustacean, like a crab, to something as simple as an insect or a spider. Now, for today's screencast, we're going to focus on a particular subphylum of the phylum Arthropoda, and that's going to be Chlycerata. And the chlycerates actually include, well, the scorpions that you see over here on the right-hand side. It also includes things like spiders. It includes ticks. It includes mites. And it does include a very ancient type of chlycerate called a horseshoe crab. And in fact, that horseshoe crab is going to be your very first animal that you're going to look at once you do make your way into lab. Now, the first thing that we need to do is we need to look at some characteristics that um, sort of identify animals that belong to the phylum Arthropoda. And one of the first ones is the exoskeleton that these animals have. And you can see over here on the right that we have an example of a lobster, crayfish-looking type animal. And if you notice, it looks like it's covered in a very, very rigid type of, um, well, skeleton that's on the outside of its body. And that's what exoskeleton means. Well, this exoskeleton actually has a very, very strong um, top layer, and this is a word that you may be familiar with, well, you should be familiar with. It's called the cuticle, and in this case, when you talk about these arthropods, that cuticle is going to be made primarily of protein and a special type of material. In fact, it's a polysaccharide. It's a type of um, sort of a starchy type material called chitin, and those two things together make this outer covering very, very strong for the animal. So in this case, we're talking about arthropods where um, if you're carrying around something that's, well, pretty heavy like this exoskeleton, you need to make sure that you have appendages that can actually support the weight of this type of body structure. And in this case, we have joints that have formed, um, and you can kind of see those joints over here, again, on the right with the animal that you see here that have formed between um, certain parts of the appendages, and that's going to allow some flexibility um, with the appendages so they can actually help to move this animal throughout the environment. Um, in order for these animals to grow, because they do have a very rigid type of exoskeleton, they have to go through a series of molts, and that's really the only way that they're going to be able to grow. So when they molt, they actually take this old exoskeleton and they shed the skeleton, and usually there's somewhat of a soft type of exoskeleton that's going to be right beneath it, and that's going to harden up after a period of time and again a form a brand new skeleton. Now, this particular group contains over three-fourths of all the known species of animals that we have on this planet. Approximately over one million species of arthropods have been recorded. Now, they do have a very well-developed organ system. Now, when we do go into lab, we're going to be looking primarily at the chlycerates. And again, I, I told you earlier, we're going to look at um, an example of a horseshoe crab, and you're going to get a chance to look at a garden spider. We're not really going to get into the organ systems of each of those animals. In other words, we're not going to dissect into these animals. But once we do make our way into crustaceans, which again do fall into this group, that is when you will get a, a chance to look at the different organ systems that are represented um, for these animals. They do have a segmented body arrangement, so it's kind of similar to the annelids that you had seen earlier, and you can kind of see the way that this animal is arranged. If you look, you can see the abdominal region and the cephalothorax region of the animals. So these would be considered two very broad segments in the animal. And if you notice, even these broad segments can actually be broken down into much smaller segments. Some of these animals are considered agents of disease, and um, they do compete with humans for food. And, but again, there's many, many more out there that are very beneficial to us. And um, they do a lot of good things for not only us, but our environment as well. Now, when you do talk about how these animals feed, it says all modes of feeding behavior are going to occur with this group of animals. Now, as I had said, the exoskeleton of this animal is really a, a significant characteristic when you talk about arthropods. Remember we had said exoskeleton basically means having a skeleton on the outside of the animal. So exo means outside. And as we had mentioned, that cuticle is very highly protective and jointed to help provide mobility to the animal. It's going to consist of an inner thick procuticle and an outer thin epicuticle. So again, looking down here at the um, diagram, you can see the procuticle being represented here. So that's going to encompass both the exocuticle and the endocuticle as well. And so basically from about here till about here, this is going to represent that procuticle. And now if you look here, we also have the epicuticle being represented, and it's actually just a very thin layer right on top of that procuticle. Now the procuticle is going to be somewhat lightweight, it's going to be relatively flexible, and again it's going to help to protect the animal from de dehydration.
And as we had said, the cuticle is going to be thin in between the segments, and it has to be because we need to remember that those appendages need to be able to move, and the whole animal itself needs to be able to move in different configurations and ways. And as we had said, in order for these animals to grow, they do have to shed their skin or molt that very rigid exoskeleton, and we do give that particular process a special name, and we call that ecdysis. And this is simply the process of shedding the outer covering and growing a new larger one right beneath it. And over here on the right you can see a cicada, which is a type of arthropod, it's an insect. And this would be considered the brand new exoskeleton, so it's relatively soft, at least at this time. And this is the old exoskeleton. So typically what happens is the arthropod is going to split, usually along the midline on the back of the animal and simply the animal is going to crawl out of that old exoskeleton. Now arthropods will typically molt four to seven times throughout their lives and again because weight is going to be an issue this does definitely limit body size. Now remember we are talking about animals that are segmented so a lot of these segments are going to either be fused or combined into specialized groups and that's a little bit different from the annelids that we had seen a little bit earlier from our previous chapter. In other words, we now have sort of these few segments that have a specialized task. And what we do is we call those specialized groups tagmata. So over here on the right, you can see um, just a praying mantis. This is your typical insect. And most insects are going to have three primary segments to their body. They're going to have an abdomen, they're going to have a thorax, and they're definitely going to have a head region for the animal. Each of these will be considered a particular tagmata. And usually each segment is going to be highly specialized. In other words, there's going to be sort of a division of labor between the different parts of the animal. Some appendages that you might find on the animal are going to function in sensing. Some of them might actually function when it comes down to food handling. Maybe some function in regards to walking. Or maybe there's ones out there that will actually function in regards to swimming. So over here on the right, you can see the appendages that are attached to sort of the, the thorax region of the animal. These would be basically specialized more for a grasping type of um, um, behavior when it comes down to praying mantises. If you look at the head region of the animal, they have mandibles. And these mandibles are going to be basically there. And they are considered appendages. They're going to be there to sort of crush food for the animal. And then, of course, down here, when you think about the thorax and the part of the abdomen, of course, you're going to be looking at various appendages that would be used for walking, swimming, again, depending on the type of arthropod that you're looking at. Now, respiration in arthropods. Most of the terrestrial or land-dwelling arthropods are going to use a very efficient, what we consider, tracheal system for oxygen transport. Now, we have a trachea as well. If you think about when we breathe, there's going to be a connection between our mouth and our lungs. And that tube that leads from our lungs up through our mouth, that's going to be considered our trachea. And so, again, its primary function is to support or to transmit oxygen. And over here, you can see the trachea in this representation uh, of um, an arthropod. And in this case, it's going to be a grasshopper. And all of these little tubes that you see sort of running throughout this animal, these are considered the trachea. Now, aquatic arthropods, on the other hand, are going to respire via um, various forms of gills. And again, this is an example of a crayfish that's been dissected. And you will do this in lab. And here you can definitely see the gills being represented in this dissected animal. Now the sense organs for arthropods, they're going to vary depending on the type of arthropod that you're looking at. So the eyes can vary from a very simple light sensitive ocelli, which that's a term that we've actually used in the past to sort of represent sort of a photoreceptive light sensitive type of structure, to a very complicated somewhat um, what we would consider a compound mosaic eye. And this would be the type of eye that we would typically think about in regards to having a lens, possibly having a cornea, a retina, etc. Now there's going to be other sensory structures, of course, that these animals are going to have. And these um, structures are going to be used for various different types of um, um, senses like touch, smell, hearing, balancing, and definitely chemical reception. Now when you look at the life cycle of an arthropod, oftentimes they're going to use a term called metamorphosis. And to morph basically means to change. And on the right hand side, this is just sort of a general idea as to how metamorphosis occurs. And typically people will look at um, something like a caterpillar and compare that to a butterfly. And like most of us know, we know the caterpillar is going to be sort of like the infant or the larval form of that adult. Well, the big thing to recognize is that the larval form is very different in this case from the adult form. And one of the main reasons that um, that's come about is to make sure that there's not really any type of competition between the larvae and the adult.
And so larvae and adults feed on different organisms and occupy very different habitats. And the main reason for this is to help them avoid competition. So now that I've introduced you to the phylum Arthropoda, we're going to narrow our focus just a little bit and we're going to look at the subphylum Clicerata. Now remember the Clicerates are going to include the spiders, it's going to include the scorpions, the mites and the ticks, and the horseshoe crab. Now Clicerates have six pairs of cephalothoracic appendages. Now don't get confused by the word cephalothoracic. Remember that's just a body region on the animal. And this is going to include the Clicera and it's going to include the pedipalps, and these are two brand new terms that we're going to look at in this group, and also four pairs of walking legs. Now they do tend to lack mandibles, and mandibles are sort of like jaws, and you would typically find those in an insect or a crustacean, and they do not have any antennas. So you're not going to find these two items in this group. Most of them will suck liquid food from their prey. Now the very first representative member we're going to look at in the subphylum Clicerata is going to be the horseshoe crabs. And these belong to the class Merostomata. Now it's very important to note that these are not crabs. They're often called crabs based on their body shape. But crabs actually belong to the um, crustaceans. And again, those do fall under the arthropods, but that's not what we're talking about in this particular subphylum. They do live in shallow water, and they do live in marine environments. And so they do live in salt water. Now they do have an unsegmented carapace that's going to cover the body in front of a very broad abdomen and a telson. So down here towards the bottom you can see the carapace right here. And that's going to be basically this entire thing that you see right here. That's going to be considered the carapace. And that carapace, as we said, is going to cover the front of the body. And it's going to um, be in front of the um, abdominal region, which is right here. And sometimes we use the term opisthosoma to identify the abdominal region of these animals. And actually when we identify the cephalothorax, we often call that the prosoma. Now one thing I did not mention, I'm not quite sure if it's actually represented here, is that the um, cephalothorax is actually this part right here. So that would be called the cephalothorax. And as I had said, sometimes we also refer to that as the prosoma. And pro actually means in front of, so that's going to be in front of the abdominal region. Now the abdomen is going to bear six pairs of very broad, thin appendages that are going to be fused at the medial line. So all of these that you would see right here would represent those appendages. And again, they're going to be fused along the medial line of the animal. They do have book gills that they use for respiration. And these are going to be exposed on some of the abdominal appendages. And so right down here is where you're going to find the um, book gills. Now the carapace has two compound and two simple eyes. So right here, these would be considered the compound eyes. And I know I kind of covered that up, but right here, these are going to be called the simple eyes. Now of course they do walk with their walking legs. Now since these are aquatic animals, they do actually swim. And they're going to use their abdominal plates or those appendages that we saw in the previous slide to actually help them swim throughout their environment. Now they do feed at night on worms and small mollusks. During the mating season, these animals will actually come to shore, so they're going to come somewhat out of the water at high tide, and that's when they're going to mate. And so the male's actually going to attach himself to the female. Now, as this female makes her way onto um, the sand to lay her eggs, she's going to dig a burrow, and as she lays her eggs, the male's going to um, add the sperm before the female attempts to cover up the eggs. Now, when the young hatch, they're going to return to the sea at the next high tide, and right down here you can see an example of how these um, larvae are going to appear once they do hatch. Really, the only big difference between the two is that they do not have the characteristic telson or tail that you would find on the um, adult horseshoe crab. So they're very similar to the adults when they do hatch. All right, guys, so that's going to finish up our very first screencast for Chapter 19. So it's very important, as always, please make sure that you have completed your screencast study guide before you come to class.